also, of course, open for you guys. If you have any other comments, we shall begin. Okay, so our agenda is pretty short today. Um, we have, again, our lovely Gina from Alaska, just giving a quick update. And then after that, we will be um, reviewing cutover communications and biennium close as workday finance is approaching us next month or not almost next month. Um, and we will also review non-UW 1099 reporting. I know there was a lot of questions during our last info meeting and forum about that. So we'll just give a little update on that. And then we will have a Q&A um, at the end. But um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Gina, you can go right ahead. OK, let me share my screen. And let me know when you get to see it. Did see you it. see my screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, fellow Huskies. Well, I'm not really a Husky, but my, my son is. And I'm sure for those of you who have met me, I'm a proud Husky parent. <laughs> um, his education with the UW has um, brought him a good career at Microsoft. And um, as a parent, I'm just proud when your investment in the education of your child um, has a good return, right? Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, my name's Gina, and I have been responsible for the Alaska Airlines and the university's relationship for many, many years. I don't know. Teresa, how many years have we been friends? I think for the past eight plus years. And um, I have been in the industry for 25 years. So yeah, you can do the math. I'm, I'm old. Um, and the best way to get a hold of me, if you should need to contact me, would be through email. Uh, but I would recommend that should you have any questions, review your resources first, which I will be sharing with you. And then the second um, resource for you would be to call our inside sales desk. Our inside sales desk um, have agents that are equipped to make the necessary waivers and favors for you. When your ask is outside their service framework, then that would be the time they would let you know to contact me. So um, our agenda for the Alaska Airlines presentation today would be to um, discuss the different programs that we have in place for the university, talk a little bit our, about One World Alliance, some updates on mileage plan, and some service updates at, at our airports. And then we will end it with some contests, um, some, with some questions where you get to win a lounge day pass to any of our lounges, including SeaTac and Portland. So take notes because I will have three questions for you and you will have three opportunities to win those prizes. Okay, so the University of Washington has three different discount programs. We have a program for corporate travel and that needs to be booked through a university contracted travel agency. And those are listed in the travel services website. Again, that's one resource, the travel services website. The second program is athletics travel. Uh, and that is booked through the athletics travel desk. And of course, I'm sure most of you know um, Nicole Marsh, Nicole Wood. And the third program is the state of Washington um, travel. So th this program is through the state. It's not directly given to the university, but through the state. Um, you're able to book state of Washington fares through your travel agencies um, that is listed on the travel services website, or you can book it on EasyBiz. And for those of you who does not have an EasyBiz account, you can always sign up for one. Again, in the, the information can be found on the travel services website. So those are the three discount programs that we have in place. Along with the, the um, programs that we have, we also have some value added items for university travel where your travelers 
can enjoy elite status. When any of your travelers have status on other airlines, we are happy to match them and have them enjoy how it is to be elite on Alaska Airlines. All you need to do is click on that link below, um, alaskaair.com slash status match, and we can match their status for three months. When they are able to fly the required number of miles, they are able to keep their status for the rest of the year. Now, when they have requested a status match towards the end of the year, then that status would be carried on towards the following year. For example, if the status match requested um, would be placed around August or September, November, December, then they will enjoy status until the end of December 2022, and that gets to be carried over to December 2023. We also have the corporate recognition program, and this is geared towards the non-elite travelers. So for those who, who do not have elite status, they are now able to enjoy those good seats right behind premium class. So if you just imagine the aircraft, when you enter the door, you would see the three to six rows of first class, followed by the three to five rows of premium class. After premium class, that's the preferred rows, and that's usually accessible only to elite members. But as a contracted account, and with your partnership with Alaska, your travelers, whether they're elite or not, now have access to those preferred seats. And not only that, um, they now also get to enjoy priority boarding. So right after our elite members get to board, then um, those non-elite um, members are able to uh, board right after them. And if we do have some irregular operations, they get priority handling as well. Now, just a little uh, reminder on some service updates. We still allow name changes or name transfer. There's usually a, a confusion between name change, name transfer, and name correction. So if you're just like correcting a name because you forgot um, to have, you place two or double letters or put an E at the end of a, of a name, you can change that for free. However, if you have to transfer a ticket to someone else, that would be a name change or a name transfer, um, you are still able to do that for a $125 fee. And I know there's a lot of bullets here, but since it's important, I'm going to go through each bullet. So the tickets are qualified to have a name change should still be valid, not expired. It has to be wholly unused. It should only be all Alaska airline segments. No other airline segment should be in there. Um, it's $125 fee. And, um, and since we don't charge a change fee anymore, then whenever you need to make any changes to the cities, to the dates, just do them all at once. Um, quick reminder, this $125 name change fee cannot, again, cannot be taken off the residual value or your travel agency will get a debit memo. So for example, if you, the original ticket is $500 and you're transferring it to another traveler and the new ticket's only $300, that $200 residual cannot be applied to the $125 change fee. So I would suggest that if you do a name change, try to reissue it to this, as close to the same value to the new ticket. Um, again, correction to the name, there's no fee. Um, if you are changing it from a gold member, like gold, gold 75K, gold 100K, the name change fee is waived. Um, again, the residual value of the ticket, um, it should be from, uh, cannot be reached from a higher fare to a lower fare. There's no residual value to that. And if you have a fully refundable fare, just go ahead and refund it. Don't go through the hassle of reissuing it. <laughs> just go refund it. Um, so those are the reminders when you're doing a name change. 
a few tips for your travelers now that travel is back. Um, have them download the Alaska Airlines app. They can select their seats or change their seats on the app, pay their bag fees, order food, check their um, status on the upgrade list if um, they are, they're requesting for an upgrade. And um, plus, they're able to check in 24 hours prior to departure. On the app, you're also able to tag your bags, pay for them if you're not elite. And then the best is it alerts you um, on time if there's a change of gates or if the departure time has been changed and all that. It usually goes to the app first before the email. Okay, so um, some Alaska Airlines updates for you. So we now fly to five different countries with 1,300 daily flights. Our fifth country being Belize. I haven't been to Belize, so that's going to be on my bucket list. We also um, joined the One World Alliance a couple of years ago. One of the good things that happened during COVID and with the Alliance, we have a thousand global destinations to 170 countries. And remember that this 13 airlines that we partner with, you're able to redeem and earn miles on any of these airlines. You just choose which mileage program you'd like to bank those miles in. And um, if your traveler is an elite member, there is elite reciprocity. So there, a gold on Alaska and they fly on Japan Airlines, they will be treated like a gold member, an elite member on Japan Airlines or any of our alliance partners. So here's a few of the um, benefits um, when you're an elite member on any of our One World Alliance partners. You earn and redeem miles. You get to alert, earn elite points. You have priority check-in. Um, you have access to preferred seats. Priority on wait list um, when you're on standby priority boarding, um, access to um, business class check-in and lounges when you are a gold in 75K, and um, first class and first class lounges when you're gold 75K or higher. Now, for those travelers who are not mileage plan members yet, we have a promotion. Um, for those based here in Seattle um, and Portland, when you sign up for a new mileage plan account, you get to earn a $25 off towards your next flight. And also just a little reminder, Alaska Airlines is the only airline that continues to um, offer you the actual miles that you flew on and not based on the cost of your tickets. So when a mileage plan member flies on Alaska, they get to earn 30% more miles. For example, if you fly in Alaska and you fly to from Seattle or San Francisco to Boston round trip, you get to earn the actual miles. That would be 5,394 miles. But on other airlines, since it's based on the, state, on the fare, that would be only around 3,400 miles. So last year, um, despite the pilot shortage that we experienced during the first part of the year and the flight cancellations towards the end of the year because of the weather, we were still able to operate a safe and reliable operation. And for that, we were able to get an award as the number one airline from Air Transport World. We were also able to sign five labor deals, um, our union groups. And of course, one of those were the pilot group we were able to successfully transition to a single fleet. So if you remember, when we acquired Virgin America, they were an all Airbus fleet. And we have retired those and sold the newer ones to other airlines. And we are now an all Boeing fleet. Hey, us Seattleites, we like to support local businesses. It's go Boeing or go home, right? Um, and for our subsidiary, um, Horizon Air, they have also retired the propellers, the Bombardiers, and we now operate an E-175, which is really great because they, they now have um, Wi-Fi on those um, aircrafts and offer the three different cabins, just like the Boeing does. And we've set up ourselves for sustainable growth. And I'll, just, I'll, I'll tell you more about it in the next few slides. 
So that was for 2022. Now for 2023, our three priorities are innovation, growing, using our efficient fleet, our simplified fleet, and doing and partnering with you, our corporate partners, for a better planet. So let's talk about innovation. It's really exciting. So we will be renovating Seattle and our other hubs, Portland, San Francisco, and LA. And after that, the smaller hubs will come to follow. So this is what we are reimagining the lobby to look like. Right now, we have counters um, with agents. We also have machines, which prints boarding passes and bag tags. We are encouraging to help our planet and to help with our initiatives. We're encouraging our guests to use their phones and do everything electronically. So we don't have to print and waste paper and cut those trees. We will be putting these machines all over our lobby. So for those guests who still want to print their boarding pass because they want to have a boarding pass in their hands when they go through security, which by the way, TSA does not check anymore. All they need to do now is scan your ID or have their, your ID go through their little machine. They don't look at your boarding pass anymore. And it brings up the flight that you are flying on. So you don't really need a boarding pass. But for those who like to print a bag tag and put it in their bags, we still have those machines that would print those. And then in the lobby, we'll have this machine on the right where you can just drop off your bags and not fall in line anymore. So there will be lots of these machines all over the place. So it'll be a quicker way for you to get through security right after you drop your bags. So this is what our electronic bag tag will look like. They will soon be available for sale sometime late fall or um, early um, winter. Uh, they're talking maybe 40 to $70. But one thing great about this electronic bag tag is after when you're using the Alaska Airlines app, after you check in and get your electronic boarding pass, the next question would be, do you have any bags to check in? And when you say yes, all you need to do is pair your phone with the bag tag and it'll check your bag to your final destination. And it not only does that, um, you can also prepay for your bags using this and it tracks your bag. So if ever there's you know, some irregular operations and your bag gets um, rerouted or goes missing, you know where your bags are. Um, you don't have to invest in those Apple Air tags <laughs> because this tag can, can do that for you. These tags are also transferable. So if you um, uh, need to uh, use a bigger bag or one of your family members um, who does not travel as often as your traveler does, then you can always um, transfer that bag to another suitcase. And of course, we still would guarantee the 20 minute baggage guarantee where we would um, give you a $25 um, gift card or two or 2,500 miles if we don't get your bags to you within 20 minutes from the time your aircraft is parked at the gate. And we will deliver your bag if ever we lose it. So all of these plans, again, will go to um, our hubs. And I'm sorry, Seattleites, we are third on the list because we're the biggest. So San Francisco will go first. We're expecting completion um, by spring 2024, uh, followed by Portland, then Seattle, then LA. And aside from the lobby, we're also um, renovating our lounges. So for those of you who will win, um, oh, I just gave it away. Um, <laughs> So anyway, my prize for the questions would be a, 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 a lounge pass. <laughs> I just gave it away. Ah, uh, me and my big mouth. Um, so you get to enjoy um, uh, your prize um, to any of our lounges. So some of those lounges, as I was saying, um, is um, undergoing through some renovation. And it will look like our flagship lounge in the North Satellite here in Seattle. So um, growing with our efficient fleet. So with all the Boeing um, orders that we've placed, um, we uh, are now an all um, simplified fleet, all Boeing and all Embraer. So this will help us um, 
with our sustainability goals because they're newer aircrafts and that would mean lower carbon emission because they're more modern, just like you know, the newer cars, lesser carbon emissions, better gas mileage. And um, so if we had to compare our, the age of our fleet with other airlines, we have the youngest fleet in the industry at 9.1 years old. So the next time you fly in Alaska, most likely you'd be flying on a newer um, aircraft and you'll have the new aircraft smell. So with that simplified um, fleet um, that will help us with you know, our carbon um, emissions, um, which will help us with attaining our big goal by achieving net zero by 2040. Um, our first step is to have um, to operate, operate efficiently. And we're doing that by um, transitioning our airport vehicles from diesel to electric. Um, as you will see on board, our flight attendants, when they go through the cabin, they always have two trash bags, one for the recyclables and one for not. Um, we now have gotten rid of bottled water and are using um, boxed water. And we also have gotten rid of the plastic cups. So we're now using paper cups. And um, we're also talking to our corporate partners. Um, should sustainability be, would be one of their goals, we're happy to partner um, if they should want to invest in sustainable air fuel, otherwise known as SAF. And we also have donated one of our propellers, the Bombardiers, to um, Avio, a company based in Portland, Oregon, for them to make it into an electric battery powered aircraft. Exciting, right? Um, we now have battery operated cars and soon we'll have battery operated aircrafts. And if not, you know, then we'll be working on some carbon offsetting, which planting trees and all that. Okay, so um, now, as I mentioned during my introduction, um, the best way for you to ask for help is to call the inside sales desk, and that is ISD, inside sales desk, or our concierge um, desk. And um, if you don't want to talk to them, you could always chat with them by clicking on that live chat. And by calling those, you'd be able to get help with seat, assignment, seat assignments, waivers and favors, revalidation for tickets, um, routing, and name corrections. And these are the contact information um, for resources at Alaska Airlines. And Sam, Renee, are, are you going to share the deck later on, right? Yes. And so Sam and Renee, the travel team, will be sharing this deck with you. And so thank you so much for your continued business and support of your hometown airline. You will see um, this Huskies airplane. We've already retired this because it's a Bombardier um, propeller airplane. This has been retired. And soon um, there's going to be a, 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 a surprise, uh, another United uh, University of Washington livery that will be soon be coming out. Cannot share that yet, so don't ask. Okay, so for those of you who have taken notes, it's time for the um, Q and no, well, you know what? what? Renee and Sam should can we do the contest first and then do the Q and A after? Would that be okay? I think that'd be best, probably. Yeah. Let's do the contest first. Again, the prices are I'm going to have three questions, and Sam and Renee are going to take note whoever gives the correct information, correct answer first. And the prices um, is, is you get a uh, lounge pass to any of our lounges. And just to note before we get started, uh, to answer the Gina's questions, please put your answers in the chat. And uh, yes. yeah, without further ado, take it away, Jane. Okay, three, two, one. Question number one. What is the most recent new mileage plan promotion for new members? What do they get towards their next travel when they sign up for a new mileage plan account? Do we have some answers, Renee? Are they coming in? 
Okay. They are. Okay. So the answer is, and this is the cutoff. It is a $25 off towards your next flight. Looks like Angie Windus said that first. Congratulations, Yay! Angie. Okay. Out of that Angie, one. congratulations. I will be sending the lounge pass to the travel team and the travel team will forward that to you. Okay, next question. Where do you go to for discount program or contract information? I repeated myself several times like an old person. Um, it's a university website. It's a link. Where do you go? Travel, blah, blah, blah. There you go. There's a hint. Okay. Um, the answer is travel services website. That would be your first resource. Go there. If you have any information that you need for corporate travel, athletics travel, state of Washington, go to the travel services website. Who's our winner? Looks like, and correct me if you think differently, Sam, but looks like Jesse Arias. Yes, I would say hey, Jesse. wonderful. Congratulations, Okay, so this is Jesse. the last question. I'm sorry, Renetti, were you saying something? Oh, I was just uh, congratulating our most recent winner here. Go ahead. Okay. So this is the last question, last opportunity for you to win a lounge pass, a lounge day pass. What is a good resource to find ticketing policies and mileage plan status? Um, uh, where, where do you go to? It was that last slide I shared with you. You don't have to name all. Just name one. Okay, and the answer is, hold on, where did I, where did I put that? So who got the answer? Oops. So you can go to the inside sales desk or the concierge desk or go through live chat. So a lot of people said app. I see Jody, he said okay. ISD. There you go. Then Jody is the winner. Jody from Advancement. Congratulations, Jody. Wonderful. Okay. Well, now, do we still have time for Q&A? Yeah. Okay, sure. Definitely. What do we have? Okay. The um, I think this is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, right? The question from Ruth about contract airfares. When will we get these? These travel agents have been telling us they're not always available. I think that's between us. Yeah, we'll contact you, Ruth, and figure out what's going on, what travel agency that is. Okay. Um, Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Um, are name changes used only for transferring to different travelers? If someone changes their legal name, would this fall under the name correction? Yes. Right. And then um, our next question is from Benel. Um, does you does you have employees qualify for discount tickets on their personal travel? I think I believe you can use um, the discounts that you're receiving from your business travel on your personal travel, but any sort of like reimbursement towards that cannot come to um, or cannot be used for. Uh, I guess future. Just so if you do any travel, whether business or personal, and you're on the program, whether you're using the corporate program or your MVP, um, you can definitely use it on your future trips if it's personal as well. Um, 
I know because there's usually a lot of leisures now, right? Mm -hmm. You you mix business and leisure at the same time. Exactly. Um, Jessica asks, will you be adding more flights um, from Everett, PAE? (laughs) Um, We, so our goal for this year is not to add any more new destinations, but we will be increasing frequency. So for like um, Las Vegas and Phoenix and Palm Springs, those are the three most popular flights out of Painfield. We may be be transitioning the equipment from an E-175, which is 100 um, plus seats, 120 seats, to maybe a Boeing fleet, which can accommodate up to 180 seats. So no new destinations um, to anywhere, not just from Pain, um, but there will be new... Um, frequencies, or maybe new routes, but no new destinations. Okay, thank you. Um, Christy, we'll get to your question at the end of um, our presentation, um, since yeah. that's more for travel. Um, so we'll keep that in there in the parking lot. Um, let's see. Nate asks, if I already purchased my ticket on the Alaska Air website, can I link our discount program to those tickets? No, I'm sorry. Um, You'll have to book it through um, the list of agencies, go to the travel services link, and you will need to book it through one of those um, authorized agencies in order to enjoy the discount. Thank you. Next from Dennis, does Alaska Airlines still offer government fares via the easy biz account are you able to do do. a quick demo to access the fair information are you able to what um are you able to do a quick demo to access the fair information so um you you'll need to sign up for easy biz and if you'd like to access um government fairs you'll have to email um easy biz to grant access to state fairs. Once those access has been granted, you can go shop and um, see additional information um, on state fairs. You'll usually find that. So EasyBus is like booking on alaskaair.com. The only difference when you look at the fairs and you would know that it's a government state fair because it would have a letter G right beside the fair. Thank you. Um, Next from Tony is going to be, does Alaska charge a passenger when they utilize a person to check in versus using the machine? Using check in versus what? Using the machine. No, no, not at all. No, (laughs) no. We, we don't nickel and dime our passengers. Uh, we don't charge you for oxygen mask either or, or when you use our laboratories. Um, no, you're, you're more than welcome to use our machines to print boarding passes or bag tags. We do somehow encourage you to do everything electronically. That way we could help save Mother Earth. Question for you, Gina. Do you charge for the amount of footsteps you take within the cabins? <laughs> no. Okay, good to know. Um, Jason asks, um, is the bag tag reimbursable? I think it's between Renee and I. Um, Just really quick, Jason, I don't think the bag tag will be reimbursable as the bag tag can be used for your personal and business flights in the future. Um, But again, once the bag tag comes out for Alaska, um, we can definitely revisit this question. Um, Lauren asks, will Alaska start having customer support by the kiosks? The machines are usually out of order or just tell me to go to the counter. So I tend to skip them and go directly to the counter. Yes, there should be one agent for every 10 machines. Um, They're just lurking around there. Um, I know they're very hard to spot because of the dark navy color with the green. (laughs) lime green um, accent, but we usually have agents, we call them lobby agents who who usually are walking around um, to help you with the machines. Um, Let me also go back to the previous question. 
uh, if you are an elite member, if your goal is 75K and 100K, check one, they are allowed one free check-in bag. Uh, I know that the question was about the bag tag, but I thought I'd pitch this too. Now, if you are in Alaska Airlines, Visa signature credit card holder, you also get to enjoy a free check-in, one free check-in bag. Um, that is a new benefit that was introduced this year. You also get $100 off towards a lounge membership. So it's just a little pitch for those credit card holders. And also you get to board with group C, so the third boarding group. So you can store your carry-on bags ahead of time and get settled in your seat ahead of time. Thank you for letting me pitch the credit card mm -hmm. benefits. No problem. Um, uh, I'm not sure what you're asking, Martha, but I see it. Um, the next one is uh, feedback from Angie. So she basically states, on a recent flight, the luggage was two hours late. How would the 20 minute guarantee have helped? Considering we've already hit the two hour limit, um, nobody had the patience to stand in line to claim the credit and there were no humans available to contact. It made me think that the 20 minute guarantee is useless. I figured there must be something I don't know. Yes. Um, so for in baggage, um, when we are unable to meet the 20 minute baggage guarantee, they you'd go to the baggage claim office and they usually have like six to 10 people um, in the office to help you. Um, you average it would be six. Um, and then you file that and they'll, they'll, they'll give you um, your choice, whether uh, 2,500 um, miles in your mileage plan account or a uh, $25 um, gift certificate towards your next flight. But yeah, they don't go to you. You have to go to the office to claim those. Thank you. Um, just so you know, everyone, uh, we'll keep answering questions till 1045 for the next four minutes, and then we will move on with the presentation. Okay. Um, Ty um, answers questions or asks, what is the code for the corporate discount to use if you're booking on Alaska Airlines directly? Code for what? Uh, I think they're thinking there is a code. You need to go through the travel agencies to get that. You cannot book our discounted rates directly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just, just to um, um, add to that. So if it's for corporate travel, we'll have to use the uh, one of the agencies listed on the travel services website in order to avail of the corporate discount rates. For athletics, you'll have to go through um, Nicole, through the, through the athletics travel desk. And for um, state of Washington fairs, you can either use one of your travel agencies, which is listed on the travel um, site, or on EasyDisc. Now there's an extra step if you do it on EasyBiz. If you do not have an EasyBiz account yet, you'll have to sign up for one. Your department needs to sign up for one. And the instructions are again on the travel services site. Also, I just wanted to mention if there was any um, misconstrued misconstru of information, if you get any benefits from your corporate discount through Alaska, like upgrades or um, lounge or anything concerning priority boarding, I, that's what I meant to use for your a next personal flight. The UW discount that we have on the website through the travel agencies or EasyBiz are only used for business. So just want to make sure no one is confused about that. Everything that is on the UW travel, travel services website and any discount through the travel agency or EasyBiz is only used for business. Just as a heads up for anyone who's confused. Um, okay, another question. I think it's from Ruth. Is the electronic bag tag assigned to a person 
or could we buy a few for our department and check them out to different travelers? Yes, they are fully transferable. So it's not assigned to a specific person because it, when you check in, it'll ask you to pair your phone with a bag tag. So um, it'll be assigned to the person who paired the phone um, with a tag. So yes, you can, you can buy one for your department. Uh, very good uh, cost cutting measure, I would say. I am just pass it around to whoever's traveling. Perfect. Okay, last question from Jared. Um, what is the baked in cost, meaning the portion of the full ticket price, which Alaska has for those printed paper tickets and how significant is it? And is the cost, saving going, cost savings going towards the carbon credits that Alaska captures? Um, not easily answered, I imagine. So simple, curious, and wanted to ask. Thank you. Uh, I do not have the specific answers to that. Um, I know that it's being tracked, uh, but not as much as we're tracking sustainable aviation fuel. Um, but yes, our ESG, our Environmental Sustainable Governance Team, are tracking all that from the CO2 um, emissions or the um, waste that you know we, we accumulate from using paper, boarding passes, and bag tags, as up to the water bottles um, and, and paper cups that we use and paper straws that we use. Yes, those are being tracked. I just don't have the specific number um, on how much savings that we're doing. But yeah, if that's your question, it's being tracked. Perfect. Okay, so it is 1045. Any other future questions that we received today or we haven't answered yet? Um, Renee and I will try our best to answer at the end of um, the main presentation meeting today. But again, thank you, Gina, for coming along and giving us a fun time, showing us all the new things about Alaska. For our winners, um, again, we will reach out to you um, for those prizes. So thank you so much. Bye. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Okay. Okay, everyone. Let me reshare my screen. Okay. Again, everyone, feel free to add any more questions. Um, about Alaska, if we can't answer them, we will definitely reach out to Gina for assistance. Um, but really quick, as you know, um, many of you have been doing a lot of workday, training, classes, prep, et cetera. Um, if you didn't know the cutover dates and biennium close dates are, have been posted, um, I did put two links on the slide. As a reminder, all these slides or the slide deck will be available after uh, the meeting. We'll post that up onto the Travel Services website, as well as email you guys everything that we went over today. Um, again, um, Cutover Communications via UWFT is posted on their SharePoint right here. And then the Procurement Services by name close dates are going to be posted right here. We do also have a page called Finance Transformation. If you didn't know on our travel services website, we do list uh, the big dates that are really important for us. Um, the first one is gonna be the Ariba freeze and read only, so no Ariba activities. It's gonna be June 16th through July 6th. Um, go live is July 6th. Uh, next is going to be submitting and fully approving all ERs by June 12th. The reason we put June 12th and not June 16th is also because us, if you uh, for travel services, um, maybe there's a high risk uh, expense on the expense report you submitted and we have to go through it. Um, just so you know, if we do deny it or ask for additional documentation, you still have that very small leeway between June 12th and June. 15th to fix it and resubmit it for approval. Um, the next big thing that a lot of people have already reached out to us about is requesting per diem advances. 
um, no advances um, beyond the travel date of 515 will be approved. Um, if you have any questions about premium advances, please reach out to us um, at travel at uw.edu. Um, any outstanding advances, so if you already have one approved, please make sure, again, it's gonna be the same as fully submitting and approving ERs. It's gonna be June 12th, so please make sure you do reconcile it by then. Renee and I will be reminding all of those lovely fiscal specialists and departments to make sure um, that we get all of that cleared out. And then, like I already said, go live is gonna be July 6th. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about this, please, Again, put it in the Q&A and we will answer those after our, our slides. Okay. You can go ahead, Renee. Thank you, Samantha. So we just thought we'd give you guys an update from the last meeting we had uh, where we had FT on here and we talked about purely FT things specifically. One of the big change impacts that came out of that meeting was that uh, we would not be able to pay non-employees on the expense support module and that they would be pushed to the miscellaneous payments module. Uh, so we do have some updates of this in that we have worked with the FT team to devise an, a workaround. So essentially the new policy or the new system we've devised with them is that uh, we travelers will be able to fill out and attach a form that uh, we will be maintaining on our website. And uh, we will be reviewing this form for compliance, as well as reviewing receipts and the, ex the expense submitted on the miscellaneous payments module. You will select the, I believe there's a specific, I don't remember the exact name, but there is a, there's an expense item or a code, a spend category, that's it, a spend category to route it to us for approval. But uh, yeah, so in this form, we will not need to, you know, have uh, these expense reports routed for 10, 1099 reporting. Uh, but just, you know, so we're all aware, the, the policy, this is not a policy change in any means. Uh, the policy currently is that if we cannot fit expenses into our accountable plan, that they will not be able to be eligible to be considered re a reimbursement will be considered income and therefore subject to 1099 report. So this will continue, you know, but um, we're just finding ways to, we have found this way at the moment to not have to do that. So things may change in the future, but for now, this is, uh, this is what we have. And we will be having some training soon in our policies section, in our policies class, which we will be revamping for workday to kind of go over this form and what we will be looking for. But uh, yeah, so I see a lot of questions that have been coming in. And I think Sam and I, we can just start alternating and getting through these yeah. from the top. Um, you want to go okay. first or you want me? Um, you can go first so I can answer the other question. <laughs> okay, so Christy Young, wants us to clarify a response from uh, an MRAM meeting. Uh, question is medical needs is approved by DSO and what does the documentation look like on the expense report? And there's an answer, a documented medical need, a note from the doctor to fly business class could be attached with the expense report or attained with other approval documentation for the award. The medical need documentation is not required to be part of the expense report, but the documentation must be available and retained. So, um, it seems this is just a question about ADA accommodations. So our official process for acquiring uh, an ADA accommodation and using one on an expense report to step outside of policy for ADA purposes is that travelers go and uh, submit their request to the disability services office and uh, meet whatever documentation that they require as they are the unit within HR properly equipped to handle things that are HIPAA sensitive, Sam and I are not. And um, once the DSO approves an ADA accommodation, then uh, travelers can just attach a, an email from them confirming that or a note on the expense report 
confirming that they have uh, an, an accommodation on file with the DSO. So I hope that answers your question, Christy. If not, you can ask a follow-up and we will delve more into the specifics. Okay, Sierra, like, um, again, I totally apologize for confusing a lot of people um, about uh, the discounts. So any discounts that we offer on the YouTube Travel Services website is gonna be business travel only. Um, I was thinking like, if you get mileage from your business flights and you wanna use your mileage to purchase a personal flight, um, kind of like what Gina was mentioning at the beginning, um, like if you wanted to rack up your miles and use that to pay for a personal flight, that's fine. But the discount itself is only business. So if you wanted to sign up um, using a travel agency and you were going on personal time, you have to use and sign up for a personal account through Christofferson and not use your UW account for personal uh, travel. So I hope that clears it out. Um, again, if you're not, um, if it's still a little confusing, please feel free to reach out to us. So Cynthia Yi asks, what is the difference between the first and business class in Alaska Airlines? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm the, if I, I imagine first class is fancier. Um, Sam, do, would you happen to know more about first and business class with Alaska? I think it depends on the flights, like Delta. Yeah, I would say it's a little harder for Alaska because the flights that I've seen are more like first uh premium I know like she mentioned elite and then like um main cabin and saver we don't see too much of business class so um if you want us to go into like deep details Cynthia we can definitely reach out to Gina for like a better explanation but right now it's all we see the difference is like first and premium class which is just really more seat assignment than actual like other benefits, maybe priority seating, of course, and priority boarding, but not, like um, nothing crazy between like first and business class that we've seen so far or viewed. Yeah. Um, Bertha asks in the app, how do we include our accumulated miles if they are not shown? I think we might need to reach out to Gina about that one. Um, We'll come back to you, Bertha. Um, you probably email. also contact uh, tech support or, or I imagine ISD. Alaska must have something like that. Yeah, I think maybe per, or reaching out to ISD, um, their desk for additional information as well. But if not, we'll reach out to Gina. Yes, indeed. T. Haynes asks, if your trip includes personal time, then you can't book through travel, UW Travel and there's a $25 fee added for travel agency, but it is a business expense. So it'd be nice to get the corporate discount. I'm not sure what you mean by booking through a travel agency. Or do you mean a travel agency? I think um, I think this depends on your comparison, truthfully. But uh, if you have a specific like circumstance, uh, you can send us an email and we'll figure that out for you. Megan asks, does this mean we can enter travel until 616 or do we need to get everything or get things in by 612? It means you have to get everything in by 612. Um, and if there is a risk flag, um, there is leeway, but we want everyone just to make sure it's in by 612 and fully approved. Yes, mm -hmm. looks like this is a three-parter. Cindy asks, what time on 616 is the Aruba freeze occurring? I believe it's 5 p.m. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens if we submit ERs after 612? Um, it's just kind of like a crunch time. So it depends, will your uh, approvers get to it on time? Um, I know a lot of people don't do the same day approvals. They kind of wait or it gets lost in their inbox and they forget to approve. So we kind of just put um, a stop at 612. 
especially if there's a high risk expense for Renee and I, and we have like a bunch, I'm pretty sure will come in from very late. Um, we don't want yours to get lost at the bottom of it and for us not to get to it in time. So we really want everyone to make sure they just fully approve it by 612. Yeah. Essentially, if it's not by if it's not in by 612, we cannot guarantee it will be reconciled or reviewed and approved and processed on this current biennium. And especially if it is not approved by 616, uh, it will not be processed. So hope that answers your question, Megan, as well. Okay. Um, John Solos asks, what should we do if we're trying to push through a travel reimbursement or travel expenses since we're purchasing ahead of travel dates? And for whatever reason, it's not going through workday finance after the freeze date. Um, Renee, do you have any comment on that? Let me read this. Let me reread this question. You mean, John, that's not like, is there another option than workday finance after the freeze dates? Yeah, so, if it's not going through workday finance after the freeze dates, not sure where it's going. Well, after July 6th, workday finance will be the only option for reimbursements. Yes. Um, just a reminder for everyone, if you have questions in the chat, please put them into the Q&A. Um, Megan asks, if travel office reviews are not needed. I think that's a follow-up to our last question. Yeah. Um, again, we still really want to push everyone to do 612 just in case maybe there are errors, whether it's from us or from one of your approvers who want to send it back. So we want everyone to have it done by 612. Yeah. Marissa says June 16th is a Friday. So to clarify, this day is not available to departments in Ariba, correct? The day is available until 5 p.m. Whatever is not finished at 5 p.m. on 616 will have to wait until Workday Finance July 6th. What is the process flow of this form? Megan, do you mean the non UW? I think she means the, yeah. The travel form. Um, we're still in progress of creating. Um, a page for you guys to do or follow instructions through. Um, I'm pretty sure we will also update the policy policy and procedures class to include that as well. Um, this will also be discussed in the the training, the ILT training on Workday. Yeah, so um, definitely we will mention it many different times. Um, but again, most likely you'll be attaching that while you're doing the um, line items for that miscellaneous payment. So that's just a gist for now, but again, we will get to it for sure in many different ways. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is, answer this in the chat. Slide deck will be emailed. Allison says, to confirm, will this work around be for us to reimburse non-UW travelers without forcing them to pay tax on the reimbursement. That is correct. Megan asks, um, I'm not understanding. So we choose an expense category in the miscellaneous payment and the reimbursement will route to travel office for approval. Uh, yes. Second, yes. There, there is a spend category, I believe, that you'll select. Um, and then you will have to attach the form um, and that will route to travel services. So we'll basically check the form, make sure all the documentation is attached. And then um, if everything is there, we'll, we'll approve and move it on in the approval flow. And we will not route for 1099 reporting. Mm -hmm. Lauren asks, how will we know when travel expenses are 1099 reportable? Well, in terms of, I'll answer this in terms of regular ERs and in terms of miscellaneous payments. 
For regular ERs, they will be 1099 reportable if they are outside of our travel policy, which are just the standard travel policies that we have had and that we have currently. So if they cannot fit into that, they uh, cannot be considered reimbursements and uh, are therefore income. As for the miscellaneous payments module in terms of uh, travel reimbursements for non-UW employees or non-UW travelers, they will be 1099 reportable if that form is not attached and uh, if the spend category is not selected. So if you select that spend category and we don't see a form or it's incorrect, it will be 1099 reportable. But everything else going through the miscellaneous pay payments module will also be, as far as I know, 1099 reportable. We're not currently experts in miscellaneous payments as this is an AP process in the current state. Okay, Megan has um, three comments that I'll just combined into one. We upload the form that is filled out to the miscellaneous payment. Yes, you will upload the form to the attachment. Um, this form um, is, is gonna actually be available under our forms page on the travel services website for everyone to get to. Um, we won't provide it on UW Connect um, per se if you want, most likely you can ask us a question and you can connect and we'll give you the form through there. But the easiest way is just to go through the travel website and just go to the forms page and just download the form. Yes. It's essentially just a, a Word document that you fill out like the other forms we have. Marissa asks, will we be able to view prior CTA transactions in JP Morgan Chase after go live? Uh, I do not know off the, the answer off the top of my head. Sam, do you happen to know that one? I do not as well. Okay. I recommend you, Marissa, look at the cutover communications page on the Workday website or the FT website and see what the cutoff for that is. I think you could also email them, uwftask at uw.edu. I apologize as uh, we do not handle that kind of stuff. Um, Bruce asks, when is the training for non-UW travelers? It will be needed right away. Um, do you mean the miscellaneous? If you mean the miscellaneous payment, that'll actually be combined with the expense report of uh, built training, BILT training. Um, so just be aware of that. I believe um, there won't be any separate miscellaneous payment training as well. Um, we would recommend, you know, everyone to sign up via their bridge app um, on the website for the trainings, but most likely the fiscal specialist and such who have the role to do this will be the ones training um, and users, of course, but most of the time it's, um, I believe it's going to be fiscal specialists. Uh, one note I want to mention on the previous question I answered about the CTA thing. You can uh, also try contacting card services for that answer. But uh, anyway, Ellie Hallman asks, currently we submit ERs, which are reviewed by your office and not XRs. Not sure who reviews. Please clarify the difference between miscellaneous and travel expense reports in the future state. Thanks. So ERs are expense reports, travel reimbursements. XRs currently are non-travel reimbursements, not miscellaneous payments. They are currently reviewed by accounts payable. They will still be reviewed by accounts payable in the future state. They will be combined into the expense report module in the future state where you will just select the business purpose as non-travel reimbursement. XRs are currently, X, or not XRs, miscellaneous payments in the current state are XPs, payments to individuals. In the future state, uh, I'm not sure what the prefix will be. I imagine it might stay the same or it might be MISC. Uh, but to clarify uh, definitively, expense reports will encompass travel reimbursements, which will be continued to be reviewed by us, and non-travel reimbursements, which will be reviewed by accounts payable. You cannot submit non-travel reimbursement expense items and travel reimbursement expense items in the same ER. 
uh, they have to be separate. As for miscellaneous payments, that will be a different module reviewed by, if not us, for this spend category, which we mentioned previously, they will be reviewed by accounts payable. Um, Tram, I see your comments about repeating the non-UW travelers training. Um, again, the, the, the process right now for training is gonna be mostly fiscal specialists and those who are kind of already doing the ERs um, for their department, those people have been selected to do the trainings via the Bridge app or reminders in the Bridge app to do built trainings and nano learnings and everything like that. Um, we recommend reaching out to possibly the UNFFT learning team, um, but in the future state for at least travel services, we will update our policy and procedures class to add everything workday related in there, or if there's any photos, et cetera, we are gonna um, update the website as well. Um, and most likely we will take the, um, the workday training, the built training that Renee and I and um, two other people in procurement will be teaching. We'll obviously edit that too for, um, everyone to see when we do our own kind of hands-on training as well in the future. But right now there isn't any individual like non-UW learner class for it. It's just combined into the expense report class technically. Just part A is expense reports and part B is going to be the miscellaneous payment and the fiscal specialists that have the ability and have that role will be able to learn the class at first and then it'll kind of trickle down um, the line, but right now we don't have anything for you to travel with others specifically. But anyways, sorry to go off on a tangent, um, but let me know, Pam, if that answers your question. Um, Niambi asks, um, will we have access to the slide show, slide showing the biennium close date? Sorry if this was already mentioned. Yes, again, um, slides will be, uh, send off to you guys, everyone in this meeting, um, or actually everyone in the listserv. So sign up for the listserv. Um, and we will also include, again, anything else that you guys want us to mention as well in this um, video. We will have the video up on YouTube within a day or two um, to review the questions. But again, um, if not, go to procurement services website and click by any close dates and that should be there for you. So I wanted to add something else to the previous question I answered about the difference between the modules. Expense report modules, a simpler way to think about it is the expense report module, which includes travel reimbursement and non-travel are for employees only. Miscellaneous payments is for non-employees. And as for James Fesselbond's question, will there be a way to add an ad hoc approver when the dean travels? In the current state, I add the approver from the provost slash president office. Will this be automated in Workday? So approvers will be pulled in based on cost center and um, fund function. Um, I think there is a process for ad hoc approvers, but it is limited to approvers that are already existing within the cost center. A um, little hazy on that one, Sam. What? Do you remember anything about that one? I believe so. You can't pull anyone from like a random and, spot. It has to be within yeah. a call center, I believe. Yes. So it's not. Uh, so it's sorry. Uh, loud noises out the window. Uh, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question, James. You can add ad hoc approvers from the from the existing call center. Okay. Megan asks. Out of um, MRAM, it was stated that the lowest logical, lowest logical, lowest cost fare needed to be purchased on federal funded travel. I'm so sorry. Um, how are we to verify this? Currently, we book only to see the economy class was purchased. How are we supposed to check that if it was the cheapest economy? Um, Mar Mary Martha adds, I'm also confused. Um, very fun to travel is supposed to be 
per you're supposed to purchase fully refundable travel tickets, not necessarily the least expensive. Am I wrong? Um, if you go to the post award fiscal compliance, um, it is going to be, or they really heavily recommend refundable flights for federally funded travel. A lot of F words. Keyword <laughs> unrestricted. <laughs> yeah. So unrestricted travel most of the time is going to be um, refundable. There is um, a little blurb or sentence after that says, if you do have a restrictive um, ticket per se, your purchased one, and may, we need to make sure, or there is a guarantee that the flight and trip will go through. Um, they do not allow any cancellations or anything like that on restricted flights turning into credits, um, they won't reimburse for that. So that's why they really push the unrestrictive, um, unrestrictive refundable flights um, for federal funding. The federal funding, yes, you know, is definitely not the cheapest one out there, but for um, federal budgets, it's the lowest logical cost for them. So again, it doesn't have to be the cheapest bare bones, Per se, I know it can be different depending on department, depending on budget, um, but for federally funded, refundable slash unrestrictive is the lowest logical cost for them. But yeah, I, I can go on more, but um, if that doesn't help, please let us know in the chat. Yeah. <clears throat> So Allison asks, does the 1099 workaround have differences between travelers who are U.S. citizens and those who are not? I think uh, the only difference in those is uh, dependent upon the form. I think we'll have to tweak the form because uh, I believe the tax office needs different information. But um, actually, no, our form, if filled out and filled out correctly, should have no difference except for we will just need to have their i9 as well as passport id page if they are leaving or entering the united states as we currently do but uh if it is 1099 reportable then it'll be slightly different because they wouldn't get a 1099 i believe it's a, i don't remember the name a 1048 or something it's a different form so Slight differences in terms of documentation. Uh, C. Crow asks, I'm also interested in the differences between first and business class info. Can you include me in that um, communication? Ye yeah, we'll again, we'll reach out. Um, if you don't want to reach out to the ISD, we'll reach out to Gina. Um, if you could put your UWNet ID on your question so we can make sure we email you back. Um, unless that is your UWNet ID, that's fine too. Um, that is. Yeah. All right, Marissa asks, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sam. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. You're good. Marissa asks, uh, we, or states, we were told that we cannot add ad hoc approvers on an ER and that the UW traveler will no longer be the last approver in the workday process, the workday ER process flow. Is there something we need to do outside of workday, re-notifying them of their final reimbursement amount and or having them sign off on the reimbursement? We enter ERs on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff, and correct any per diem request and other errors. So yes, that is correct. In the current, in the future state, the traveler will no longer be the last approver in the workday flow. So if you are creating the expense report on behalf of the traveler, they will be getting notifications every step of the process of what is happening with their expense report. So, um, but beyond that, once it is paid there will be no routing for their final approval or anything. So if you want to have your own internal process where you ask them to review it before you provide the final approval, then um, you may do that, but that will not be a built-in process within Workday. And um, yeah, so ad hoc approvers, I think I answered that in the previous answer. So, uh, but yeah, we are not mandating you do anything outside of workday as they will be notified every step of the way. And they should also know who's doing it. So they should be able to know who, how to contact you if they have any 
issues with how their expense report is being made. Uh, he, uh, he asks, I meant that if I use the unit of travel, then they will charge me $25 on top of the ticket if we use them to ticket flights and get the unit discount. Oh, for the travel agency, yeah. So anytime you use a travel agency in general, um, they will charge you a booking fee to use them. They do range from, um, depending, like, I guess, the, depending on the expense. So car, hotel, airfare, um, international flight, domestic flight, depending on the um, travel agency, they'll charge you different ways, but they will always charge you a booking fee um, or an agent fee for assistance. Um, if that is not what you meant, team, please let me know again. Ruth Levy asks, what time on 612, 5 p.m.? 5 p.m., yes. Or actually, no, 5 p.m. on 616 is the freeze date on 612, um, I guess the end of the day, too. So, yeah, 5 p.m. Um, Raquel asks, some travelers will be visiting UW for research work, and they are foreigners. Will the foreign scientists non UW be subject to per diem advance? I mean, be subject to per diem on the meal allowance. Do you mean on like a per diem advance, or do you mean a, a living allowance? Um, if if you are, it they will be subject to um the per diem, per diem allowance um, when foreign nationals come to Seattle. Either way, the answer is yes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Unless you want it to be 1099 reportable. Uh, so Mary Martha McNally. Uh, oh, you, I think this is a comment to the previous question, but yes, so federally funded travel does require you to purchase CD. Quote oh. from their website, travel must be taken using the least expensive class of travel, more commonly known as economy. Ex but uh, then they have a follow-up there, type of ticket, the least expensive unrestricted fare is allowable. Unrestricted airfare allows for cancellation or changes with a penalty value that is less than the cost of the ticket. Any further questions on federal compliance and post-award fiscal compliance, please contact uh, GCA for this. I'll put their email in the chat and they can provide you with uh, definitive answers to your federally funding, federal funding questions. Uh, Linda asks, what happens if a request is processed and didn't get in fully approved by 612? What will happen? Do we need to reprocess the request in workday after 7 6? So, if you submit something, let's say on 6, I don't know, June 7th or something, and nothing happens from June 7th till technically 5 p.m. 6 16, um, and it doesn't get approved, you would have to resubmit again in workday for the um, reimbursement. So anything that doesn't get in or doesn't get fully approved in general for all ERs, whether reconciling, not reconciling, excuse, ignore that, <laughs> just ERs and, and regular um, travel reimbursements must be uh, resubmitted again and go through the approval flow again um, in workday. Um, all reconciliations has to be done by 612. There's, that's a wall, there's no um, ways to get around that. Note on that, if uh, I think I mentioned it before, but I'll emphasize it again. If expense reports are not fully approved by 616, by the freeze date, uh, and they are processed in workday, it will be on the new biennium. Yeah. So, anyway, Alicia Hamilton asks Would you recommend all longtime users to retake the procedures class slash training once it has workday use included? Yes. Uh, Policies should remain the same for the most part, but we'll be tweaking some things that I think it would be very beneficial for everybody to learn about in terms of the workday environment. 
Marissa asks, can you confirm the security role required for completing the CTA reveal? Are card holders automatically granted access? Will there still be two reviewers, the card holder and the reviewer too? Um, I believe you might have to reach out to um, the C the yeah, either card services and our AP about this. Um, since uh, we don't have the exact flow for us since we're just focusing on expense reports for travel reimbursement. Um, but sorry about that, Marissa. But again, reach out to card services or AP about the question. So James Fesselbon asks, what are our best practices for getting a comparison car service fare, like if Uber or Lyft was used? So hang on, there's a big truck going by. Apologize for that. I live on a heavily trafficked road and it is very hot and uh, kind of can't stand to not have the window open right now. Uh, so in terms of this question, I'm not sure what you mean about comparison car service fares for car services. Uber or Lyft can be used just so long as, um, wait, can you, can you hear me now? I see someone says they cannot hear anything. Okay, that's good. So um, in terms of comparisons for car service fares, I don't think we accept comparisons for car service fares. If they are non-reimbursable, they are non-reimbursable. But um, yeah. Um, Stephanie asks, uh, what built sessions will be available for travel processes? Um, the ones that are available for just tra for travel processes is going to be, I don't remember the actual, like, I think it's PRO, but it's going to be, it'll say, a, it, it will literally say expense report and um, miscellaneous payment on the title of it. Um, it's uh, APR01. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oh, wait, no, that's a different one. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. RPSC. Um, I think it is AP. APV01 workday yeah. manage expense reports and miscellaneous payments. Um, yep. If you don't have it available on your bridge app, most likely you're going to have to learn later um, and gain that security role. Um, uh, if you guys don't remember, um, it is very user forward. So the user themselves, or the traveler in our sense, themselves will be doing the expense report, but there is an additional um, expense, uh, expense data entry specialist position that will help you um, do expense reports on the behalf of others. You would need that security role to do that. If not, again, the traveler is able to do the expense report themselves, which I know a lot of you are like, that doesn't happen that often, but again, you need that security role to gain that access. Yeah. So Cynthia Yi asks, if the traveler has prior approval for business class because of medical reasons, but the airline only has a first class or premium class, do we need to get approval for the first class? That is correct. You need to get approval for the first class or they could just go lower. Okay. Megan asks, my understanding is that XR and ER in the future state will be in the expense uh, report module only for UW employees. XR and ER in the future state for students, um, non-employee will go through the miscellaneous payment module. You are correct. Um, again, the expense report module will be there. You will have to choose if it's a non-travel reimbursement, which is uh, e-reimbursement technically. Um, in the current state right now, um, or business travel reimbursement, which is the ER that you guys know about just for travel. And then anything regarding um, not students in general, students, non-UW, or nationals will all have to be moved to the miscellaneous payment module if it's um, for travel, at least. 
yeah. You Satoyo, are... oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Satoyo Kawaguchi asks, could you clarify if a missed payment module will be entered or submitted by a non-UW or fiscal specialist at UW or both? So it would be a fiscal specialist at UW, uh, not a non, I don't, I don't believe non-employees will have access to Workday as they currently do not have access to Ariba. So yes, those will be submitted on behalf of them. Uh, Kristen asks, when, when, you, when will your training be available? Currently, right now, for Renee and I, we're kind of um, in the beginning process of uh, those classes. So we will start training classes that are available via Bridge, um, I believe, starting um, at the end of the month or within the next week or two. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, again, it's only those available on the Bridge app. For post bridge app, post go live and such like that, um, we are still in progress um, of seeing what we want to put together. Um, most likely we will use the fill class and maybe edit or tweak a couple things uh, for you guys um, in the future state. But right now we're only relying on the fill training on the app or bridge app. Cindy Fan asks, what journey is the travel related built under in Bridge? I thought I had the security role to do expense reports and workday, but never got notification for travel trainings. I don't see anything in Bridge to sign up. So you should have the journey expense data entry specialist. You'll have to take the APR01 recorded demo. I believe there's another one, expense. Oh my God. Essentially the course, you can find it if you click on learning in the bridge. If you're on the bridge app, if you click on learning and you click on, well, it should bring up needs your attention and it should say, it should mention AP V01 workday manage expense reports and miscellaneous payments. That is the class we'll be teaching. Uh, you can also look on the travel, the training calendar on that same tab and find them. The first one is on the 30th of May. Uh, it is already full, apparently. And then the next one is the next day. There are six seats remaining. So sign up now. We will have 10 sessions. And uh, some of them will be UWM specific, but most of them will be UWA specific. Okay. So if you do not see these at all in your bridge, I would contact your supervisor or your administrator to make sure you are signed up for the correct security roles to complete expense reports, which I believe is um, expense data entry specialist, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Ruth asks, Please confirm UW FD training will include how to fill out the special non UW traveler no 1099 tax form. As of right now, we will mention a blurb on it on the training. Um, there, what we have seen so far, there's no exact training included in the VILT training right now for, to fill out the form. Um, we are working on that and that is an in progress. But um, again, once we get that settled, we will definitely post the instructions on the website and or present those on our policy and procedures class. One note to make clear, well, more what about what the VILT training is about. It is not about travel policy. It is about using Workday to submit expense reports and miscellaneous payments. Essentially, it is more similar to our e-travel hands-on training than policies and procedures. We will not be covering policy. We will also not be teaching all of them. So the other trainers will not know to cover policy. So no policy matters will be discussed in the VILT training. Uh, Raquel says living allowance. Uh, I think that was Her in reference to an earlier question. I think we answered that, but uh, yeah. if not, feel free to follow, yes. to follow up. Ruth it's, Levy has a, another question. What needs to happen so that tra travelers do not receive many notifications 
as their travel is being worked on. This was a problem initially in Ariba until we discovered the workaround of not adding a requester's name anywhere. Huh. So, um, to for traveler, if travelers do not want to receive notifications of where their expense report is at, I believe they can tweak the notification settings within Ariba or within Workday, but they will not be. But then, you know, they may run the risk of, since they're not going to be on the final approval, they may run the risk of missing out on certain things if they're incorrect. But that is up to their own preference and their own discretion to change. Okay. Asun asks, is there a travel date restriction for living allowance like the per diem advances? I'm planning to request a living allowance for a foreign visitor arriving 531. Um, there is no restriction, the, the restriction isn't the same. Um, so you can still request um, a living allowance um, all the way up until 612. Um, so if you're a foreigner is, if the foreign national is coming before then, um, you should be fine or before 612, you should be okay um, to receive the living allowance. Um, we are gonna say living allowance um, is gonna be the same due date as um, expense reports submitting and approving. All right, next question. I only see, I see only one 522 training for policies and procedures. Will you have more as this coincides with the new workday reporting? So this will be the, the last training that we have on the current state policies and procedures. Uh, as Sam and I will be taking an increased, will be taking an increased role in doing the VILT trainings and training people on how to use Workday, we will not have the bandwidth to continue that training during the time. We might schedule one during the freeze, but uh, at this point, we you know, UWFT has been an ever-evolving process, and we will need to see how it goes. But um, yeah, so for now, that is the last one that we plan on doing to the, our bandwidth. Okay. Um, James says going to point A then personal stuff then going to point B. Oh, oh, disregard. Oh, okay. I believe that's in relation to the um, yeah, the car service question. Um, okay. Tony asks, so to clarify on timeline, we must ensure that all ERs are approved at unit, including Traveler, by June 16th. Um, can we, well, we can expect you to travel service to process, to process and ERs will be complete in Ariba. Um, of course, y'all are human and may miss some. All ERs fully approved after 612 will redo in workday after July 6th correct? Um, preferably on the timeline we want, yes, you, if you really want to go down to the last minute, <laughs> 6, 16, 5 p.m. is the last time you can press the approve button for your whole approval flow. Um, we recommend not doing that. Um, but again, um, I know um, there will be people who will. Um, it, yeah, it happens again, like not just us as humans, but everyone is human. So we understand that if it doesn't get fully approved by then, again, everything will have to be redone in Workday. Um, talking about the 612, so let's say your units submits or your department submits an ER on 612, it gets through a, the, a full approval process, doesn't include um, travel services because there's no high risk expenses and it gets fully approved by let's say 614. Um, you are still good to go. Um, the expense report will still be put on um, the current biennium and not uh, the one after workday. Um, so there isn't any issue of redoing that travel expense again. So if you can get everything fully approved by that by 616 technically, but we are saying 612 just in case. Um, you there is no issue of re of redoing an expense report again in a workday. But please try your best. Yes, please try your best. 
Um, oh, um, the chat. That's all the questions we have right now. Um, yeah, like Matt, Matt did say earlier, um, miles that you get from your business travel should be used for um, your future business travel, but it's really hard to enforce that. Um, Just keep it reasonable. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, I think that's it for now. If you have any other questions, we'll be on for another minute or so. Um, if not, you are free to go. Again, thank you so much for joining us today in our spring quarter um, travel information meeting. We will see you guys again in the fall. Thank you. And in the VILT trainings. And the VILT trainings. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll get through it. August will arrive, I think. Well, we're all on this workday train together. That's right. Ellie. Um, Staying on for quick help with understanding okay. ER versus MISC. Um, sure. Do you want to come off mute? Yeah. Oh, allow her to talk. Yeah. Oh, there she is. There you go. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just having a, a super hard time. Um, with i'm a visual person and so it's will so the difference between so the what is now the er will kind of be two things in the future one for in future state one for uw travelers and one for non-uw travelers as well as students or or are they is the miscellaneous nested within the typical er the miscellaneous payment module is a different section. To think a about different... it in the current okay. state way, think about it as them going through P2I. That's a different process handled by AP currently. It's a different module in Ariba. Uh, so essentially all non-employee travel, including students, I believe that that one's tentative, will be going to this other module, like another house basically. And in our house, we are going to have employees, including employee reimbursements, which will include travel and non-travel. We will only be doing the room. There will be two rooms in this house, and we will only be sitting and doing stuff in the room for people with travel stuff. Okay. So there will be another room for AP, and this will be our houses for employees only. Okay. So no wait, one house with two rooms in it, AP and travel. Yes. And and so right now, is that the way it is? We we don't do very many. Um, I assume it's reimbursement to individuals. Is that correct? Is that what uh, payment to individuals? Payment reimbursement to individuals. is uh right now it's basically like they got their own completely different house for reimbursing employees. It's not it's not P2I. That's the uh, P2I is taxable stuff right now they have another one called those are xrs it's different it's another module in ariba where they reimburse employees and that is where ap is but they're moving in with us essentially we're going to okay. be roommates and we're going to have a key to their other alternative apartment for miscellaneous payments in case of you know travel stuff for non-employees is that helpful no. I don't know. I'm still, uh, I'm still having trouble. So basically one house and it's going to encompass three types of payments that we, they're taking, we currently have three things that we're paying that, that are reimbursements. There's ERs and XRs. And right now you would say that those are in two different houses and yes. they're going to be in one house, Yes. but two different rooms. Yes. And then miscellaneous payments 
is what is currently payments to individuals. Yes. And that was previously in the um, AP house, but yeah. now it's going to kind of be nested between the two. It's going to be a, an adjoining room. Yeah, you could say that. More like a mother-in-law unit, I would think. Okay, so, and who's and if it's a if it's a missile, who's going to be monitoring that? Is that just is that since it is is it just travel related? No, the, so that will be future state. In the future state, that mother-in-law unit in the backyard will be just it'll it'll be managed mainly by accounts payable, like they manage it now. They'll okay. keep they'll keep that. They 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 wanted to keep their spare room, so but we will have the keys, so to speak, to go in there if there is some non-employee travel happening, and we can okay. do reviews. So they'll own it. What what kind of things will they be processing in that space? Because I'm having be processing ahead. things that are currently processed under P two I, so like honorariums. Stipends. I don't know. I can't speak too expertly on P2Is, but it's like uh, it's taxable Obvious, stuff. Taxable stuff. Okay. Yes. And now, when someone fills out the miscellaneous form for, for submission travel. for for travel, it will they will have to. So I so I should tell you. We, as fiscal specialists, do all travel. So, um, so we will continue to do this for them, but they will be required to provide us if they are um, a, a UW student who is domestic. They would be giving us a 1099 with their while when they're seeking reimbursement, and if they are uh, foreign non UW, they would be giving us the equivalent of a 1049 with their reimbursement stuff. So that stuff, flip it around, we're giving it to them, but only if they don't fill out this form and don't select the, if they don't attach the form or they don't select our expense item that will bring us into the mother in law unit, it will route to the normal way of a, a review of P2Is, which will subject them to 1099 reporting and they will get one at the end of the year. Okay, can we just kind of hear that, that again? Um, so it's gonna be the fiscal specialist on our side. They're not gonna do anything. And I, I, I don't, they're not gonna do anything. Everything's gonna come through our office and how are we going to route it in the future state? what do we do we need to when they send us their messy files and request for reimbursement they're gonna and we're gonna say hey we, we need your 1099 or hey we need your 1049 you, you will not be asking for those that that is we something won't you won't the, the tax office will provide those to them they'll be mailed to them like w-2s are mailed out now so essentially what you do now is you take their mess of receipts and all that, and you put it in a reboot, right? For students right, and, and not employees. In the future state, you will take that and you will use it to fill out the form if it's travel. And then okay. you will attach that form, including hopefully, you know, a more organized version of these receipts. You will attach that to the miscellaneous payment as well as the form. Then we will review it. If it's correct. They will not get a 1099 and they will not, they will not be subject to taxes. Does that make sense? Okay. So a couple of weeks ago, it would be subject to taxes. Is that correct? Uh, currently, yeah, it would be subject to taxes if they did a P2I. But, you know, like if, they, if you did a travel reimbursement, it would not be. Okay. So, so basically... They're, I'm going to submit their stuff into the miscellaneous module and attach a form and all yes. of their stuff. Okay, got it. Yes. So, I'll leave, so we will either do an expense report 
type of situation or we will be doing a miscellaneous and this is all travel related and yes. they'll basically be will be responsible for the same things except they will go in through two different mechanisms that is correct yes okay so just funneled in two different um two different formats okay got it got it and then any tax stuff will not apply to travel which is a little different than it was a couple of weeks ago tax is stuff currently does not apply to travel but i thought we were hearing that essentially it, the what we were saying is that so right now the policy is that if they don't do if they don't you know if things don't fall within our policies within the stuff that we train and talk about all the time stuff that sam and i dream about basically I mean, you I mean, can't you mean to have Sam. nightmares about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have nightmares about. <laughs> if they don't do any of that, they don't attach receipts. Legally, we have to tax it because it doesn't fall under our accountable plan as a reimbursement. But because Sam and I take our job so seriously and have nightmares and dreams about expense reports and policy, <laughs> they we don't we can avoid that. So okay. essentially, we're going to continue trying to avoid that through this form. Through the, the form, origi which will the original, request proper documentation. Yeah, and will route to us. And to okay. answer Lauren's question in the Q&A, if they do this, you will not have to collect social security numbers and ITINs because we have worked with the FT team so that travelers don't have to provide that to submit a miscellaneous payment if they, are, if they're, if they choose the travel expense item or spend category. Okay. So, um. And then one last thing that you may or may not be able to help me wrap my head around. So um, on my team, we are, we all wear very many hats. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about these crazy things called security roles and mm -hmm. who gets what role. Um, my, and, and based on the security role they're assigned, they get certain train offered certain training. Yeah. I and then and so I'm not sure. I I assume that I would want all the people on my team because we wear many hats um to have this training. Is that what you, your understanding would also be? Yeah. If anyone's expected to wear the hat of submitting expense reports, they should have the security role and therefore they will have to go through the training. Got it. All right. Thank you so much for staying on and answering those questions for me. I appreciate it. No problem, Ellie. Thanks All for right. coming. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And I do see we have one more question from Tina Liu. Uh, how to review transactions in Workday. Uh, I believe there will be a very robust reporting uh, functionality in Workday. Uh, it will vary on the kind of transaction. But uh, you will be trained this in your training. I believe there is bridge training already that uh, goes over this kind of stuff. So I don't want to tell you how and bungle it because I'm, you know, we're still learning the stuff too. So I'm I'm no pro, but I by any mean, but yeah. So thank you, Tina, for your question. And if you don't get it answered by your training, and uh, we've figure out better answers, you can email us and we can try to help you out. Um, well, Monica, um, I've been told that some of those are not available for the same person. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Workday is an ever-evolving thing. It's oh. a very complex process that we're going through. There's millions of moving parts and you know it, the, what gets pushed out on july 6th will not be the final version as we will continue yeah. to work on it and improve it and uh you know I, i'm not exactly sure what roles they may have been talking about but yeah. i'm sure there'll be a very robust process for requesting roles that uh need to be added and uh we'll get through this monica and everyone else who's still on the call. But uh, yeah, so there'll be some bumps along the way, but we'll get there. It'll just, it'll take a while. 
Okay. Um, I guess that is the end of our presentation for the last 24 people, or 22 people, 21 people that are still here. Still here. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to email us at travel at uw.edu or uh, call us. Um, we will see you in August. Thank you. Thank you.